I'm Dr. Ana Maria Cárdenas, Senior Director of Global Medical Affairs at Fidi Integrated Diagnostic Solutions. We are proud to welcome you to this opening session as a gold sponsor of this year's World Sepsis Congress. Through partnerships like the ones that you will be hearing about today, we bring awareness and drive change on leading public health needs like sepsis and antimicrobial resistance. A huge thank you to our partners that are advancing the world of health with us. Welcome. Hello, and a very warm welcome from everybody at the Global Sepsis Alliance to our fourth World Sepsis Congress, a Congress which will address one global health threat, the threat posed jointly by sepsis, pandemics, and antimicrobial resistance. My name's Dr. Ron Daniels. It's my privilege to be moderator for this opening session. My background is an intensive care doctor within the United Kingdom. I'm vice president of the global chief executive of the UK. I would like to invite colleagues and friends from all over the world to participate actively in this Congress. But before we move on, I'd like to hand over to my friend and colleague, the president of the Global SEPS Alliance, Professor Tex Kassoon. Thank you very much, Ron. Colleagues, friends, and distinguished guests, I bring you greetings and a good morning from Vancouver, Canada, and a warm welcome to all attendees joining us from across the globe. Whether it's a good day, good evening, or good night, wherever you are, I hope you are keeping well and safe. We gather here today to address a topic that has become all too familiar in recent times, sepsis. The devastating effects of this condition has been brought to the forefront by the ongoing COVID pandemic that has affected millions of people worldwide. Sepsis is not just a medical condition. It's a crisis that affects patients, families, healthcare workers, and society as a, uh, uh, as a whole. The toll it takes on our healthcare system and society cannot be underestimated. The need for effective treatment and preventative strategies have never been more urgent. I am proud to say that the Global Sepsis Alliance and Regional Alliances, along with our WHO colleagues, among others, have made significant prog progress in prevention and treatment of sepsis. However, we must acknowledge that there's still a lot more work to be done. As we gather here today, we renew our commitment to this cause and strive to make further advancements in the fight against sepsis. I am thrilled to announce that for the first time we are offering CME credits for these sessions. This highlights our commitment not only to share knowledge, but to promote continuous learning in the field of sepsis. All sessions are recorded and will be released on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. So if you miss a session, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to access uh, the, the talks. The conference features 16 sessions with over 85 speakers from 35 countries that address various aspects of sepsis, including clinical care, cutting edge research, AI, big data, policy, diagnostics, AMR, patient safety, and much more, including quality improvement and advocacy. With such a wide range of topics covered, there is something of relevance for everyone. Uh, I am delighted to share that we have over 15,000 registrants from 190 countries, which is a testament to the importance of this topic and the impact it has on people's lives worldwide. I'm excited about the opportunity to learn from each other and to collaborate to make a positive difference in the fight against sepsis. Before we officially begin the glo uh, fourth Global Sepsis Alliance Congress, 
I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our office staff, uh, the scientific committee, speakers, moderators, and the tech team who have worked tirelessly to ensure the success of this event. Their dedication, talent, and hard work have been instrumental in bringing us all together today. I would also like to thank our sponsors, BD, Biomerics, Thermo Fisher, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Janssen, Radiometer, Abionic, and the Waltrop Bergman Foundation, who have been and continue to generously support us over the years. Without the help, uh, we would not be here today. today. Once again, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you for joining us at this important event. I hope that the insights gained and knowledge shared during this conference will help pave the way for a brighter future in the fight against sepsis. Thank you very much. And I hand you over to our um, moderator, Ron Daniel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tex, for those wise words. I'd like to really encourage all participants to actively involve themselves in discussions. And we can use the chat function to ask questions. Obviously, our speakers with pre-recorded sessions won't be able to answer questions, but a majority of our speakers are going to be live. So please do place your questions in the chat boxes and the moderators will be able to see those and hopefully ask some of your questions to our panelists. So we're going to move on in just a moment, but it's, uh, I believe we may have a slide arising relatively shortly. Um, I would like to thank our exclusive sponsor for this opening session, um, a company which you know needs little introduction to those involved in infectious diseases and sepsis who have worked not only in the scientific and academic spaces, but also in the policy and advocacy spaces. So thank you so much to BD for sponsoring this session. Now we're going to be joined in a moment with a uh, video of greetings from a man with a background in training in the immunology of infectious diseases um, and in community health, who went on to become a member of the federal government in Ethiopia for over a decade, including as seven years as the health minister. And now, of course, we know him as Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization. Dr. Kisun, President of the Global Sepsis Alliance, Professor Reinhardt, Founding President, dear colleagues, and friends. Every year, 11 million people die from sepsis. The great tragedy is that in almost all cases, these are preventable deaths. All too frequently, sepsis is underdiagnosed at an early stage when it's still reversible. We need to stop these deadly infections by strengthening health information systems improving infection prevention and control practices, ensuring access to rapid diagnostic tools, quality care, and safe and affordable medicines and vaccines. A top priority must be addressing the lack of basic hand hygiene services in health facilities, which globally is estimated at 50%. Indeed, it's particularly appropriate that this Congress is focusing on the interrelationships between sepsis, pandemics, and antimicrobial resistance. We must urgently step up efforts to fight sepsis, providing countries with a means to detect, treat, and prevent this grave condition. Health systems and health facilities, health and care workers, industry and policy makers can all contribute to preventing sepsis. Patients and their families have an important role to play too as advocates for better and safer care. We thank all of you who have dedicated their work to this cause. We encourage you to continue fighting against sepsis as a global health threat. I thank you. 
Vielen Dank. Thank you so very much to our colleague and someone who's been fighting to improve outcomes from sepsis around the world with us, Dr. Tedros. Uh, I hope we now have um, live from the Federal, Min Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany, Veronika von Messling. Um, Veronika, we yeah, hear and see you loud and clear. Wonderful. So it is my great pleasure uh, to be here today. And I was very honored by the invitation. So dear Professor Reinhardt, dear Professor Kisun, thank you so much for this invitation. And uh, I am, would like to uh, thank you for this opportunity to reach out to a global audience today to open the first, the fourth World Sepsis Congress. The Global Sepsis Alliance gained visibility for a devastating deadly condition with millions of deaths every year worldwide and gives hopes to patients and their families. The German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, which I am representing today, acknowledges the burden of this condition and the necessity for effective prevention, diagnostics, and treatment. Consequently, BMBF has been supporting sepsis-related research since quite a long time. Funded research projects cover nearly all aspects of this condition, from diagnostics through the development of clinical guidelines up to research on new vaccines or antibiotics. We are also convinced that sepsis needs to be tackled globally and that global cooperation has immediate benefits for patients wherever they live. Therefore, our support doesn't stop at German borders, but rather we invest in international research cooperations on sepsis with a particular focus on African countries. Although significant improvements in the diagnostic and in the treatment have been achieved, sepsis remains one of the most severe health threats worldwide. Related to sepsis, Antimicrobial resistance is an increasing challenge which we have to face already now and even more so in the future. New antibiotics, surveillance, strategies for prevention and vaccination are very much needed. The SARS uh, pandemic demonstrated that this has to happen in a one health approach, which encompasses the health of humans, animals, and the environment we all share. Another very important component of the battle against sepsis are solid, resilient health systems worldwide. Because of that, BMBF supports public health and health systems research in the context of global health as a specific emphasis. During the following days, the speakers will share best practice examples and how to tackle sepsis. This exchange, and the perspective of patients and other stakeholders will hopefully lead to a fruitful meeting and generate important progress in this really important area. I wish you, I wish you a successful meeting and very interesting discussions. And I'm personally delighted to be in an online meeting for once again and uh, experiencing this international presence from, from the safety and comfort of my office. So I'm very curious about the discussions and, and the multitude of voices we will be hearing. Thank you so much and good luck. Thank you, Professor Dr. von Messling for your, for your words of wisdom, your, your kind words and your contribution. Um, before we move on to the main speakers of the session, um, I, I think I'd, I'd just like to highlight what, what I'm seeing in the chat. We, we have incredible representation from so many countries, just very briefly scrolling, Tanzania from Australia, from Peru, from Serbia, Rwanda, Colombia, uh, Tanzania, just so many countries. It's wonderful to bring people from such diverse backgrounds, such diverse healthcare systems and economies together into one session. It really is so important. I'm now delighted to introduce um, with a session on sepsis and the achievement of the sustainable development goals, the administrator of the United Nations Development Programme, Achim Steiner. Uh, as we all know, Achim Steiner has been a global leader in sustainable development, climate resilience and international strategies for cooperation for, for almost three decades now, working tirelessly. So very much look forward 
um, Achim, to, to hearing what you have to share. Professor Dr. Konrad Reinhardt, President of the Global Sepsis Alliance. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a timely moment to raise awareness of the global health threat posed by sepsis. This life-threatening response to an infection remains under-recognized. If not diagnosed early and treated promptly, it can lead to shock, multi-organ failure, and death. Indeed, patients who are critically ill with COVID-19 and other infectious diseases are amongst those at higher risk of developing sepsis and eventually dying from it. Known as the silent killer, sepsis kills someone every 2.8 seconds. Yet sepsis is not merely an issue confined to the health sphere. It is also a pressing development issue. Approximately 85% of sepsis cases and sepsis-related deaths worldwide occur in low- and middle-income countries. It particularly affects vulnerable populations, including those aged over 60, newborn children, and people with pre-existing conditions. Indeed, reduced access to infection prevention strategies and resilient healthcare systems in developing countries is resulting in significantly poorer outcomes. We know that tackling sepsis is crucial to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. To achieve the SDG3 targets, including the reduction of child mortality, and to expand universal health coverage, we must accelerate action to address the burden of sepsis in both high- and low-income countries. With the recognition that most cases are either preventable or treatable if caught in time, the World Health Organization is leading global efforts to tackle the scourge of sepsis. That means acting upon the lessons of COVID-19, focusing on equity, strengthening health systems, and investing in prevention. As a foundation, hygiene is vital. We must ensure that everyone has access to safe and clean drinking water and sanitation. Notable progress is now being made. For instance, between the years 2015 and 2020, 107 million people gained access to safely managed drinking water at home. In addition, the United Nations is providing healthcare workers with vital skills. It is also informing communities on infection risks and the need to promptly seek care. We know that prevention is a first line of defense against sepsis. To this end, the UN family is working to ensure access to safe and affordable medicines and vaccines, which reduce the risk of contracting infections. Look, for instance, to the work of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, which is supporting immunization programs in developing countries through public-private partnerships. Led by key actors, including the World Health Organization and UNICEF, our sister agencies, this work is ultimately helping to prevent millions of sepsis infections. The United Nations and its many partners are also working to strengthen health information systems and ensure access to rapid diagnostic tools. We also know that most studies of sepsis have been conducted in high-income countries. There is limited scientific evidence from the rest of the world. The global community must do more to improve high-quality data collection along with more research into treatments. We also need a renewed focus on sepsis prevention amongst newborns and on tackling antimicrobial resistance, an important driver of the condition. Professor Reinhardt, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the Global Sepsis Alliance for their dedicated efforts to raise awareness and make sepsis a national and global priority. Indeed, contextualizing investments in sepsis prevention and treatment within the global movement around pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response is also a clear opportunity. Moreover, the new pandemic accord being developed has a vital role to play in tackling the conditions that allow sepsis to flourish. Finally, please continue to rely on the support of the United Nations family, UNDP, to deploy the latest science, technology, and innovation to stop sepsis in its tracks. Thank you so much for your work your leadership, and let us hope that the world will quickly learn the vital lessons that you have been at the forefront of advocating. Thank you so very much to Achim Steiner there. Um, we're now moving on to the live components of this session. So every speaker from here on in 
will be live and therefore available to answer a small number of questions at the end of their session. It's an incredible privilege now to introduce uh, Dr. John Kangasong, who oversees the US President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, um, which is an enormous commitment. And if that weren't enough, he led, for example, the COVID-19 response in Africa and secured millions of vaccine doses for African countries. He's also WHO Special Envoy on COVID-19 preparedness. But I think just, just looking at the accolades for John, it's incredible. The, the uh, just short example of Time Magazine's 2021 list of most influential people, Fortune Magazine's 2021 world's 50 greatest leaders, Bloomberg 2021 50 most influential people. And it, last year in 2022, he became the first recipient and laureate of the Virchow Prize for Global Health. And he's also got the rare honour of having been knighted by the governments, not only of his home country of Cameroon, but also by Côte d'Ivoire and Senegal. So, Dr. Kendrach Kangasung, thank you so much for joining us. Very much look forward to hearing from you around key success fighters, factors in the fight against AIDS and HIV. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. So um, let me just start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to take part in this very important session uh, or conference. And I will, in the next 10 minutes, um, discuss with you uh, lessons from HIV AIDS, the successes there. But I thought I should um, reflect, take you back into a 20 years journey of what uh, the fight against HIV AIDS has been, and especially given that uh, PEPFAR, the program that I oversee, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, as it's commonly called, uh, is celebrating uh, 20 years of its uh, engagement with partners countries. When you look back uh, several years ago, uh, what HIV AIDS has done, it is a, a tale, uh, that, a story that must be told in its entirety. This is a, a, a perspective that was written in the New England Journal of Medicine and published in June uh, 2013 by Alan Brand. And he stated how AIDS invented global health. And I think this title is so aptly uh, indicated for this topic we are discussing, given the enormity of sepsis as we will discuss during over this conference. So if you look at the... Um, what this paper says, I mean, I invite you to just read the, the, the bottom part of this. It actually says, it, or it speaks to the overflowing impact of what the fight against HIV AIDS has done. And it actually states below, and I invite you to read that. It says that AIDS has reshaped conventional wisdom in public health, research, practice, cultural attitudes, and social behavior, and most notably, AIDS epidemic has provided the foundation for revolution that upend traditional approaches to international health. And I can agree more with that. So where do we come from? <clears throat> About 20 years ago in 2003, uh, AIDS, HIV AIDS was a devastating disease, in, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. The graph you see here on the left-hand side shows you how life expectancy had decreased significantly in several African countries, for example, in Zimbabwe, the life expectancy had decreased by 35 years, Botswana, 28 years, South Africa, 12 years. And that also led to uh, a GDP loss of about 2.6% decline in those uh, heavily affected um, countries. And these are the pictures that we saw 20 years ago, uh, pictures of uh, a, a coffin on your right-hand side. The coffin shops were flourishing in many African countries, and the left-hand side uh, showed you the despair faces of the individuals, the families, and, and the communities. Then in January uh, 2003, at the State of the Union address, President Bush uh, declared the launch of PEPFA. And he said something that was remarkable at that time, and it still is even uh, more remarkable 20 years down the road. And he said, seldom has history offered a greater opportunity to do so much for so many. Very powerful words. And that political commitment, and I'll come back to that when I reflect on the successes of the fight against HIV AIDS, 
led to a remarkable surge in the funding for, for HIV AIDS. The slide you see here uh, is uh, published, was, it's a paper that was published in Science in 2008. And if you look at the graph on your right hand side, it shows you how HIV funding started peaking. Uh, following uh, the, the, the Global Fund in 2002 that Kofi Annan and others were instrumental in setting up, and then PEPFAR uh, in 2003. But since then, you could see very clearly how uh, over the years uh, HIV funding had increased. And although it has plateaued now, it, it was remarkable that at that point, it became the most important asset that we needed in um, our toolbox to fight HIV AIDS. So what is the overall impact of PEPFAR? PEPFAR today has saved over 25 million lives. About 20 million women, men, children are presently on life-saving treatment. Uh, thanks to PEPFAR's direct investment, 5.5 million babies have been born free of HIV AIDS. And besides that, it has had other developmental outcomes, including a 2.1 percent increase in GDP per capita in countries that PEPFAS supports. Uh, child mortality has decreased about 35% in those countries that uh, PEPFAS is supporting HIV fights, and immunization rates have increased by 10%, and the rates of dropout from schools among girls and boys have decreased about 9%. So it not only has PEPFAS saved lives, it has supported countries uh, to achieve more, greater developmental goals. And we are making progress to achieving the, the 395s. The 395s are the goals agreed by the, the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, supported by UN AIDS, which essentially says by the year 2025, we should get 95% uh, of people who are infected should know their status, 95% of those should be on treatment, and 95% should achieve virus suppression. So in countries in sub-Saharan Africa where PEPFA is supporting them, you have three categories of countries. Those in, in green are those that are nearing or exceeding the 95-95 goals. I will not, I'll leave it there for you to read. Those in, in, in ye yellow are those that are striving towards that goal, and those in red are countries that still have some work to be done. So again, let me just pause here to say that we've made remarkable progress in the fight against HIV AIDS, but we still have remarkable work to do in order to bring HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat by the year 2030. So let me just unpack a few uh, gaps that we, we, we are dealing with. If you take some of those countries in the green uh, column, which are countries uh, moving sp speedily towards the 395, and you look at them carefully. So let's just focus on Botswana, which is the, the, the series of bars on your left-hand side. Uh, the dark bar that is uh, 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 individuals who know their status, and or people living with HIV AIDS who know their status. The, the light blue are individuals that are on treatment of those who know their status, and the green are those with undetectable viral load. Clearly, Botswana has, uh, has exceeded 95, 98, 98. And uh, that is also true for Eswatini, Malawi, and other countries. But if you now unpack those, that, those countries carefully, I'll just use one example and to illustrate that Botswana, Eswatini, and Malawi, you realize that if you look at, uh, you focus your analysis on the age group between 15 to 24, there's a lot of work still to be done. If you recall, Botswana um, had exceeded 95 when you aggregate the entire population, but for young people, you still have a lot of work to do, especially in the first 95, which in this age group, only 85% of those living with HIV AIDS know their status. And on your right hand side in Malawi, that number decreases to about 74%. So that is a big gap there. So why is this so? We see, we recognize that 20 years ago, those in this age group were not uh, uh, around. They were not born and they didn't see the ugly face of HIV AIDS. Uh, thanks to the success of programs like the Global Fund and PEPFAR, UN AIDS and World Bank and others, uh, we successfully cleaned the ugly face of HIV AIDS. And these young people are not seeing this. And so that becomes a very, very vulnerable group that we must focus on. In countries that are reaching 95-95, you see a remarkable trend where the number of, of, of new infections, that is the green bars, are decreasing steadily. 
and, and the line is actually uh, crossing over the number of total deaths there. That is what you want to see. And that's what you, you, you achieve when countries have exceeded their 95, 95, 95. On your right-hand side is, is Mozambique, that a country that has not reached that target. And you can see that the number of new infections is still higher, remarkably higher than the number of deaths. And you want to continue to bend that curve down as much as possible. So where do we go from here? So if we continue to do what we're doing, accelerating the number of people that we are putting on treatment, that is the blue bars, then there's a chance that our arrow, the, the dotted line can continue to go move forward and we'll hit the 2025 target, which is what where we want to be uh, by 20, uh, uh, to achieve the 395s. But if we do not do that, then we we'll miss that target. That is the red dotted line. So which is exactly what we are trying to do. PEPFAR working with Global Fund and UNAIDS is really pushing for countries to accelerate their, uh, their activities or their efforts to get to the, the, the 395. So again, uh, we have three milestones to reach the 2025 goals, which is what I indicated here in the middle. The three sets of countries are listed on the left-hand side. And our destination is 2030. By 2030, which is seven short years from now, our hope and goal is that, which is universal hope and goal, is that we bring HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat. So as PEPFA, we've developed a strategy which was launched on the 1st of December, a strategy that hinges on, on five pillars. One is to know our equity, uh, where the inequity gaps are and priority populations. We have to sustain the response and focus on strengthening health systems, work on partnerships and follow the science. And then we have three enablers, community leadership, innovation, and leading with data. I think this slide is so up for the conversation we're having with SEPTIS because as the previous speaker said, we have to address issues of inequities and health systems to address uh, the challenge, the, the global challenge we have with, with septis. Let me just go through very quickly in my remaining minutes uh, to address some of these gaps. In some countries, we continue to see that uh, the burden of the new infection is among adolescent girls and young women, and it's at times three times more new infections that we see in adolescent girls than the equivalent uh, uh, age group in, in boys. So that is a gap we need to focus on. Another area of a, a gap we need to focus on to bring HIV AIDS to an end by the year 2030 is in children. The red lines you see here, uh, viral load suppression, uh, the progress we've made in viral load suppression since 2015, uh, but the blue lines are viral load suppressions in children. Clearly you see that we've stagnated and we need to do a little bit more, a, a better job in identifying children, bringing them into treatment and suppressing their viremia. Another area of interest is key population, where you see that in countries, this is a slide from Zimbabwe, where uh, the first 90 is challenged in key populations, but once you, you, you identify them, uh, like men who have sex with men, you can easily bring them into treatment and then viral load is suppressed. But until you find them and identify them, it is always a challenge. So those structural barriers that are out there, like bad policies and laws that criminalize uh, key populations, it doesn't work well for the HIV uh, fight. So just as I move to the end, again, our strategy is to make sure that we use this, uh, um, the, the leaking sink approach where we continue to prevent new infections. That is, uh, we turn off the tap, where we continue to mop the floor, which is the treatment. That is the ultimate goal of achieving our 95-95. We believe strongly that our efforts have to be balanced between prevention and, and treatment exercises. So if you ask me in a nutshell, what are the key success factors in the fight against HIV AIDS that can apply to the, the conversation we are having today, which is acceptance, I can think of five, the, the, what I call the philosophy of five Ps. We'd have to know your pathogen. We have to know our population. Population means you have to use data to drive action. That has been the key success of PEPFAR. PEPFAR has remained a data-driven, evidence-based uh, programming that allows us to focus the resources where the, the, the disease burden is most. Policy issues are so, so important. Politics, good politics equals good global health practice. And I'll come back to that, and partnerships. This is what I characterized over the years as the five Ps that we must adopt if we have to ad address some of these key problems that are global in nature. And 
if you look at this uh, a story that um, uh, Gail Smith published in Forbes just a few uh, in 2002, she says the story of HIV AIDS epidemic is one of tragedy and trauma. It is a story that about political leader, leaders finding common grounds. I summarize that reflection in one line, which says, or one equation, which says, good politics plus good public health equals million life saves. So let me just conclude with this picture of President Bush again, where in September uh, last year, I went to visit with President Bush and shared with him this picture of a baby. That is the baby you see on the lower picture, looking at him in his eyes when he visited Ethiopia. And next to President Bush is a, a, the mother of that baby. She is HIV positive, born the bearer of that baby who is HIV negative, and it's all thanks to a collective global action that resulted uh, in the delivery of PEPFAR and Global Fund that allowed that baby to be alive. That is the kind of partnership and boldness that we should deploy to addressing the challenges we face with septic. Thank you so much for your, the opportunity to address you this morning. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kangasong. I, I, I haven't uh, seen any immediate questions for you coming into the chat, so I'd encourage participants uh, from all over the world to, to ask questions of you, but but I'll, I'll open if I may. Um, you, you mentioned the, the experience, particularly in young people and adolescents, um, that perhaps they weren't exposed to the very understandable and needful fear messaging in the 1980s and 90s around HIV and AIDS. Um, and obviously we are hopefully beginning to come through a global pandemic in which I think fear was an important driver of engagement of governments and large scale international collaboration and cooperation. Um, sepsis is, is maybe different and I'm not sure that we should have populations in fear of sepsis uh, in their daily lives. So I, I think what, what lessons from HIV and AIDS in terms of public messaging might be directly important to improving outcomes from sepsis, given that they're slightly different? Yeah, they're, they're absolutely slightly different. But uh, as I, what I concluded with uh, the philosophy of the five Ps is what um, I have reflected on over uh, the years. And regardless of the pandemic or the epidemic you're dealing with, you, you want to be sure that you, you, you governize the population, okay? That, is, that if you bring full awareness to the population, uh, at times you may have the tools, and if the population is not fully uh, governized, the tools don't go anywhere. We saw that during the COVID crisis, where even with vaccines, it became problematic then. Uh, you have to have good policies, I mean, regardless of whether you're dealing with septives or not. Then political commitment, I mean, a lot follow, follows through political commitment. I didn't mention funding, because funding by itself is difficult to get if you don't have a good political commitment. So I showed this slide deliberately in the early uh, 2000s, where with political commitment, especially from the UN, uh, the UN in 2001 issued for the first time the UN Security Council a declaration commit, uh, declaring HIV AIDS as a, a, a security threat. And in 2002, Global Fund was established, 2003, uh, PEPFAR. And you saw that with the funding, uh, the political commitment funding came and that became that is necessary in fighting any of this pandemic. Partnerships, as we've all recognized, regardless of what we're dealing with, uh, you need partnership. Partnership with the private sector, partnership with governments, partnership with NGOs, partnership with governments. Without such partnerships, uh, we struggle, regardless of the best signs that we have. We, we fall very quickly into the value of that. Thank you so much. Um, and so we, we've had one question come in and I, I just remind participants to please put at speaker at the beginning of their question so that we can identify them um but so the, the question arising is what's the role of of prep treatment um in uh various populations in prevention of hiv infection now prep treatment uh continues to be a, a key instrument uh, or intervention in a toolkit. I mean, we have we really adhere with the, the what UNAIDS is promoting called combination prevention, where we're using all tools that are available for prevention. If you remember the, the analogy of the kitchen sink that I, I mentioned, that one way of turning that tap up is really to scale up prep. 
and PrEP has supported the scale of, of, of about 1.4 million uh, PrEP in different populations. Uh, we are hoping that with a long acting uh, um, uh, uh, injectable PrEP, we can even do more. Okay. So um, we're working with the companies to uh, increase the, the access to that or to introduce long acting PrEP into our program in there. So I think it's a, a, a cornerstone of our strategy will continue to be both scaling up prevention and scaling up treatment. Thank you so much for a very detailed answer. And there's no more questions arising, Dr. Kengasung, although there are plenty of people saying thank you for your wonderful presentation within the chat. So I'd like to thank you very much for participating in the Fourth World Sepsis Congress, and we shall move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So the next speaker will not need introduction to anyone who has attended a World Sepsis Congress or been involved in the international fight against sepsis. Um, Professor Dr. Comrade Reinhardt is the international champion of sepsis without whom we would not be here. He is the founding president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. He worked with a very small number of us in those very early days. Um, to initiate the concept of World Sepsis Day and the World Sepsis Declaration. And for those of you who don't know about the World Sepsis Declaration, we would urge you to go to our website and find out more about that and perhaps to sign it. Um, Comrades, former chairman of the International Sepsis Forum and very active, not only internationally, but also in research and in advocacy in his home country of Germany. So, Conrad is going to talk to us about key lessons around sepsis getting on the international agenda. Thank you, comrade. Thank you, Ron, for your kind uh, words. And um, I would like to uh, really thank also Dr. Nakan Zong uh, on his excellent presentation because we can learn from him so much, especially in respect to the five Ps he mentions. This especially applies to sepsis uh, under the aspect of the role of also policy and not only science uh, is uh, uh, really uh, crucial. So this is my conflict of interest. Uh, and I mentioned this because this company has got uh, approval, emergency use approval for uh, uh, a compound that uh, blocks the immune response uh, to viral uh, sepsis, and uh, we just heard how important science is. I also would uh, follow up to the introduction uh, by Dr. Tetris, who rightly has mentioned that it's indeed a tragedy that most of deaths are from sepsis are preventable. And this complies completely with the vision that we had uh, when we founded the Global Sepsis Alliance to come and to get to zero preventable deaths. It's bad that in contrast uh, with the fact that everybody knows now what HIV is, what cancer is, what stroke is, but that sepsis is a life-threatening condition that arises when the body's response to an infection ensures its own tissues is not well known. And this is really important given that we it was already understood or argued that probably except from a few conditions patients seem not to die from the pathogen but rather from the body's response to infection rather than from forming and in the meanwhile uh, we have learned these lessons and better understood what happens especially on the level of the cardiocirculatory system and also on the level of the microcirculation and that there will be potential treatments uh, which add to the treatment against the pathogen. And you had some numbers by Dr. Detras, and this indeed were the numbers from 2017. In the meanwhile, there are additional reports from the authors of the Global Burden of Disease Report from 2019, which such as 13.7 million infection-related uh, deaths, and their 7.7 million deaths were associated with the most common um, infectious syndromes 
caused by butter chance. And according to their uh, criteria of the global burden of disease report, this makes that the, the second leading cause of death globally only for bacterial sepsis. And we all know that COVID-19 adds to the burden of sepsis. And that interestingly was already mentioned in the report that accompanied the WHO sepsis resolution, which we are, we are able to achieve in 2017, that also viruses, be it, it be influenza, be it dengue, be it SARS-CoV, be it MERS, be it yellow fever virus, etc., add to this uh, a pertin. And in 1900, Sir William Osler, one of the leading physicians of his time, made the point that humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. And of these, the greatest by far are the most terrible is fever, speaking about infections and, 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 and obviously the more severe uh, sepsis cases. And if you look at the numbers, this is still true uh, today and compared to uh, hunger uh, and deaths by by war and, and also in comparison to um, cancer and, 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 and of course also MR is a big issue. And it's hard to understand how come that such a global burden was not perceived and is not known uh, until uh, and we are just at a start in the meanwhile. And ironically, this has to do with the success in the fight against sepsis, especially in the high income countries at the US, where due to measures which, which have been already mentioned, mostly public health measures, including uh, chlorination of water, sanitation, but also development antimicrobials and vaccines, etc., led to the notion by quite a number of influential um, policymakers uh, that the book of infectious diseases might be even closed. And of course, this was a, a Western perspective because it's clear, and it was the Werner data, of course, at this time, that 80% uh, of infections uh, come from low and middle income uh, countries. And even in the high income countries, so this is uh, recent data that you can find on the website of the Department of Health uh, in the United States that more than 1.7 million annually uh, develop sepsis there and uh, that uh, nearly 270,000 annually die. And the healthcare cost of this is 62 billions. Um, and so, as I said, uh, it was surprising that when we, that the knowledge on advocacy for sepsis, when we started this moving, uh, before we started this movement, sepsis was fully defined and understood. There were no, only two national and local sepsis initiatives. Sepsis was no priority at the level of WHO, G7, or G20. Sepsis was no priority for any WHO member state. And according the CDCs and sepsis uh, was not adequately represented in the global burden of disease report 10 years ago. And there were uh, clearly not uh, any uh, sepsis specific immunomodular ter ter therapies. So we have made some progress since the launch of the sepsis declaration, which was rightly, rightly mentioned by uh, Ron Daniels, who had a big role in his country. Um, that now we better understand and have a clear definition that I mentioned what sepsis diff makes it different from uncomplicated infections. We have more than 100,000 member, organiz uh, 1, member organizations and a regional sepsis alliance on all continents. The WHO sepsis resolution was adapted and sepsis was addressed by the Global Burden of Disease Report. And still it's few countries, uh, about 20, who have launched in the meanwhile national sepsis programs and also 
quite a number of CDCs, ironically not the European Center of Disease Controls, have addressed sepsis in the meanwhile. And I mentioned these reports that have been published in addition um, to uh, the, the, the report that we uh, published in 2020 in the Lancet on the first study on the global burden of, of sepsis. So we've had to learn, and we can still learn, as we heard, a lot from cancer. And they already in the 40s, 50s uh, understood that for any illness to rise to political prominence, it needed marketing. And a disease needed to be transformed politically before it could be transformed scientifically. And you can read this nicely in this um, book by this Pulitzer Prize author and uh, oncologist, Hitata Mukherjee. And um, that's what I was so pleased also to hear what Dr. Nokansom has said. And they asked rightly for a moonshot for cancer and the Manhattan Project for cancer. And they had big ads just to mobilize policymakers, miss in the Washington Post, etc., cetera, yeah, and, and address the high ranking policymakers. So we consider it a great success that in 2017, the WHO adopted this resolution, which was one of our priority when we got started with the Global Sepsis Alliance and people like Margaret Chan, uh, uh, the former Minister of Health and the former Chancellor, Chancellor Minister have done a great job to support this. And clearly Sir Liam Donaldson mentioned on the occasion of the adoption of this resolution who was patient envoy and still is for patient safety at the WHO, that indeed the pub public and political space is a space where sepsis needs to be in order to things uh, to change. So, and as mentioned, we, it's requested and this resolution urges its member state to include sepsis in the national health system strategies. And the key approaches, and you heard this already uh, by Dr. Steiner, is prevention of infection by vaccination, clean care, early recognition because sepsis is an emergency as it's stroke and myocardial infarction and appropriate supportive care. We were very pleased that also the former commissioner of health and food safety, uh, Andrea Kaitis, who is a heart surgeon, became the patron when we founded the uh, European Sepsis Alliance. And, and he rightly declared that sepsis is the most preventable cause of death and disability at Europe. And, and, but this is not, and this is based on data from Sweden where we have data from health records, but uh, normally what is documented in, in the ICD classification is only less than one quarter or of, uh, of sepsis cases. So what helped us to increase uh, the awareness for this hidden healthcare disaster, because it's still hidden, it's a hidden pandemic. It was indeed research on the magnitude and the health economic burden of sepsis. The proof that infection prevention, early recognition, and the quality of healthcare systems works and is important and foremost, involvement and advocacy of patients and family also made a big difference. And, and clearly also the fact that we initiated this healthcare, the World Sepsis Day movement, and were learning from each other. This was already mentioned how important this is, made a difference and that we got quite a number of high rank policymakers and parliamentarians be behind our goal. So indeed, both in UK and in the US, the fact that families who did not accept that they unnecessarily left, lost their last one, they addressed hiring policymakers, they went to the media, and this was indeed a game changer. And in this case, for the state of New York, Governor Cuomo, after the tragic death, unnecessary death of a young boy uh, in New York State, which was taken up uh, in the New York Times, um, resulted in the fact that he, by a mandate, forced all 197 hospitals in New York State 
to document the degree to which they apply what is called uh, with the so-called uh, sepsis uh, bundles. And, and by doing so, the mortality in the meanwhile decreased by one third from 31% to 22%. And also there were great actions in close collaboration between the new uh, UK Sepsis Trust, and this is courtesy by Ron Delius's pictures, that also Jeremy Hunt and the National Health Service took actions, public awareness campaigns, and also offered families and provided a 24-7 uh, contact number for babies and children uh, just to be able to get informed uh, on um, the question to get an answer whether it might be sepsis. And along with this, the number of patients in UK and also in other countries in the US increase, who got their antimicrobial within the first hour increased from around 30% to 80 to 90%. And this went along with a highly significant decrease in mortality. The same happened by initiative by the current Prime Minister of Ireland, who at this time was a Minister of Health and on the occasion of an unnecessary death of a mother and her unborn child also initiated such a campaign for Ireland. And simply by implementing rapid response teams in UK, in, in, in Australia, and, in, and made it mandatory for every hospital to have it, mortality by IC, from ICU traded uh, sepsis halved between 20 and 2012, which supports the, the fact that the quality of a healthcare system uh, really works and that awareness works and that a culture, uh, which is also reflected by having critical incidents reporting system and learning from it uh, is crucial. It has also, and is possible on the hospital level, which was demonstrated both in Germany by the engagement of esteemed colleagues like um, Dr. Brundling from Greifswald, but also by the CEO of Northwell Health, um, who took this initiative uh, shortly after we launched in 2010 the Global Sepsis Allowance uh, at his place. And I mentioned already, we need indeed to learn from any other. And we do so and by implementing simple measures to improve sepsis recognition, prevention, uh, and reporting outcomes, uh, we can make uh, a difference and millions of lives could be saved life. And it's hard to understand, as I mentioned already, that despite the high incidence of sepsis, and the fact that it has been demonstrated that it's preventable, uh, that only 20 countries so far have adopted uh, uh, according national strategies or have at least decided to go along these lines. So that's, it's very encouraging that the German Minister of Health, which who we communicate quite closely and who we have also awarded for this achievement to get sepsis um, in the committee, in the communique of the, by the G7 health ministers, where he addressed, where they addressed that the, it's important to look for the synergies between antimicrobial stewardship and IP, IPC programs, and uh, also that the G7 uh, ministers uh, uh, committed, are committed to boost the implementation of the WHO sepsis resolution uh, on, a, on a global scale. But also the WHO need to make sepsis really a top priority and integral part of their high profile WHO United Nations campaigns on the level of the WHO headquarter and regional offices, which is not yet the case um, in all their important programs. And unfortunately, currently, where Sepsis Day is not yet among the 16 official WHO World Health Days, and as I mentioned, it was very important to educate not only healthcare workers, but also lay people around the globe. And these are goals that we have to look for. 
and to finalize and to make this point that, and this is another analogy to HIV AIDS, without research and without private public partnership and develop innovative therapeutic approaches, we can add, in addition to quality improvement of and implementation of what we know. So this is data from a good friend, Dr. Chamarellis, also the chair of the European Sepsis Alliance, who demonstrated that with an interleukin receptor antagonist, they could significantly reduce in patients at high, uh, high risk patients of COVID-19, um, the, the, the co combination of, of death and the requirement of uh, mechanical ventilation and this effectiveness of this compound was also reflected in the WHO 10 point uh, scale. And lastly, both these approaches, uh, uh, this approach um, has been uh, approved now by FDA and EMA for emergency use authorization. And likewise, as I mentioned, uh, um, this data recently published in Lancet Respiratory, uh, which resulted in a 27 point uh, mortality reaction in COVID 19 uh, sepsis in the sickest patients who most of them were already in mechanical ventilation. And for the pre denied defined European, Western European population, the uh, effect was even higher. So, in summary, at the end, um, one advantage of the pandemic, if you want to call it, was that the potential of immunomodulatory therapies um, and is, has been rekindled and readdressed in this uh, pandemic. And now it is part of our armamentarium, if you want to say so. So to finish general lessons, that we learned uh, also from the pandemic is that improvement of health literacy in the community is key. Strengthening of quality improvement of healthcare systems. The better the development and better access to effective antimicrobials, and not only antimicrobials, because, because we need to realize that about 30% of all sepsis cases are due to viral infections access and encouragement to use available vaccines on a global scale, the improvement of access to sensitive and specific microbiological tests, which is not yet the case in most parts of the world, is crucial. And finally, uh, also the access to intensive care and effective immunomodular therapy uh, needs to be uh, a right, a human right, as Dr. Petros mentioned it, um, uh, all over uh, the world. And so please share our vision, uh, which is uh, zero, zero preventable deaths from sepsis. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so very much, Comrade. And, you know, interesting and highly relevant observations on the rekindling of interest in immunomodulatory therapy. And, and I think precision medicine in, in, in sepsis and severe infection as well. We are slightly over time, comrade. So I've just got one question that's come in um, from a French speaking colleague, which really asks, um, should we now be talking about viral sepsis, which I assume means in the wake of the pandemic? Yeah, for sure. And, and as I mentioned, so the, this effect, it's, it's, it's part of the sepsis definitions with which we came up in 2016, and it was rightly taken over that all kinds of pathogens uh, may result uh, in, in, in sepsis. And if, uh, in addition, if you have infection, be it by malaria or be it by bacteria or virus, and have an organ dysfunction. So this is the definition of sepsis. And for right, we should use this uh, word and also policymakers should use it and, and everybody should use it because otherwise we won't overcome uh, the poor understanding of sepsis uh, and also not understand the, the real burden of sepsis. Thank you, comrade. That That's clear. And uh, I 
obviously fully support and agree with your, your response. So we're going to move on to our next speaker in the interests of time, um, who's going to talk to us about key success factors in the fight against climate change, which is really important that we, we learn lessons from this fight. We're going to hear from Professor Anders Lefferman, who is Professor of the Dynamics of Climate System uh, at the University of Potsdam. Um, amongst other things, he's, uh, he reports to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and he's a heavily published author, as well as leading public debates and often being cited in international media. So, Professor Lefferman, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. I'm, I'm quite out of uh, scope, I feel. Um, so I'm, I'm a physicist, not a physician, um, but I'll try to get you give you some information that might be relevant uh, and that you might not have heard about climate change. Obviously, I'm uh, starting by the uh, general features that potentially everyone knows the Earth is warming. It has been warming by 1.1 degrees, uh, depending on where you set uh, the exact reference time um, that is in the pre-industrial area. But um, um, just to put this into perspective, this is 1.1 degrees of uh, global warming, global av annual average warming, um, and that is in, in Celsius, and uh, that is in comparison to the limit uh, of 1.5 degrees that is um, aimed for in the Paris Climate Agreement, an agreement, an international agreement that has been signed as quick as no other agreement in the history of the United Nations by 195 um, countries in 2015 and then signed in 2016, and that wants to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, the upper limit of the Paris Climate Agreement is two degrees, and um, since there is an inertia, not in not only in the political sphere and, and the economic sphere, but in the physical sphere of the climate system, because the world ocean is taking up most of the heat, actually more than 90% of the heat that we are trapping on the planet by greenhouse gases, um, and is pumping it into the deep ocean, and that leads to a delay in the response of the surface temperature. Um, we will find, we will, even if we start, uh, if we w stop uh, emitting carbon dioxide um, immediately, we will have a delayed after uh, war warming, if you like, until we get into equilibrium. And that'll bring us close to 1.5 degrees. So I think and a lot of, a lot of colleagues disagree, but I think politically, um, it is very unlikely that we keep the 1.5 degrees. I, I, I shouldn't say a lot of colleagues disagree because um, this is a bad matter of assessment of the political system. In principle, it is possible physically to keep the 1.5 degrees, but um, I think we should uh, we should focus on um, on combating climate change altogether. And let me tell you in a, min a minute what that means. The most important information that you basically need if you are in a pub and discuss climate change with uh, non-experts that think that they know about climate change and say there is no climate change man-made is that um, we don't derive our knowledge of climate uh, change from model simulations or even from observations of the past, but we have a very basic physical understanding of um, what carbon dioxide does uh, with the radiative balance of our planet. And that is very important to know because I'm a theoretical physicist by training and I wouldn't be in climate ch change research if it wasn't for this very basic understanding that um, you cannot circumvent in, by, in any means. So we know the emission and absorption spectra of the molecule CO2 or the molecule CH4, methane, or the nitrous oxides that are greenhouse gases. And um, just combining this with a basic understanding of quantum mechanics, and um, we uh, we we know that every doubling of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will increase the temperature of the planet by 1.1 degrees. Um, but uh, so that wouldn't worry us too much. But then there's the first thermodynamic. Um, feedback in the climate system that is also very simple. A warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor. That is the clausius clapeyron equation of uh, 1834. So it's very basic physics. That's why Ludwig Boltzmann is here. 
and um, that tells you that, and then that brings more water vapor into, into a warmer atmosphere. Now we go back to quantum mechanics and learn by that, that um, this CH4, uh, um, um, H2O, the um, water vapor is actually a greenhouse gas again, because we can also here compute the emission and absor absorption spectra. And putting this all together means that for every doubling of the CO2 in the atmosphere, we get three degrees of global warming. And that is worrisome. And that has been known for more than 100 years. Now, if, if you only take one message from this very small intervention uh, into your Congress here from my side, uh, it is that CO2 is carbon, um, the, um, the, the, the CO2 that we produce by burning oil, gas, and coal. The sea has been out of the atmosphere for 100 million years. We put it into the atmosphere, and it stays there basically forever. So for any practical purposes, the, um, the CO2 is a little bit like microplastic. Once we've put it out there, it'll stay in the atmosphere forever. And that means that if you want to stabilize the temperature of the planet, no matter where you want to stabilize it, whether you want to stabilize it at 1.5 degrees, as in the Paris Climate Agreement, 2 degrees, upper limit of the Paris Climate Agreement, or even if you don't want to do anything in this century and let it go to 5 degrees, which is what we get if we don't do anything by the end of the century, even if you want to stabilize it there, you have to get to zero carbon emissions. And that is the most important message, and that is an undisputable so we have to get to zero net zero carbon emissions globally within the next 20 years if we want to keep the two degrees Celsius. And that is that tells you that you don't have to do less with respect to carbon emissions. You have to do everything different. You have to get from a fossil fuel driven economy worldwide to a renewable energy driven economy. And that is the big transition that we have to do. And we'll have to do that while being bombarded by weather extremes. And that's what I uh, want to um, highlight now, because what are the actual um, impacts of, of climate change onto society? A lot of people think it's slow moving um, aspects, large scale moving aspects of the climate system like the changes of the climate zones that are gradually moving into warmer areas or colder areas, formerly colder areas, or something like sea level rise, which we understand quite well and which we have started to initiate by our warming um, and which will eventually hit our cultural heritage around the globe quite dramatically because about, we, um, about one fifth of the world cultural heritage is near the coast and we'll flood it at after when we get to three degrees. Um, but that is not the real reason the, uh, that why we have to combat climate change because it's mainly um, changing, it's changing so slowly that we will be able to adapt. The problem is weather extremes. I already mentioned the clausius clapeyron equation that tells you how much water vapor you can get into the atmosphere. And this is a very crucial equation um, because it, um, it dominates the evolution of weather extremes in a warming climate. Um, an atmosphere that has more water vapor in it holds more energy and is thereby um, fostering weather extremes. I cannot go into the details of weather extremes here because there are there's obviously different physics for heat wave, a drought, or um, even an um, um, extreme rainfall event or a flood or a, even a, a cold spill, they all have different physics behind it. And we start to better and better understand this physics. But overall, it is clear that weather extremes um, in general are going to intensify and become more frequent. And the big question is, how will society work with this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do this kind of mind experiment. I'm doing everything very quickly today because it's a very short um, um, uh, slot here. But is, imagine that if the snow catastrophe that we've seen in December 2018 in between New York and Chicago, which was caused by the meandering of the jet stream in the north, would have um, happened in the same year as the drought in the Midwest, which did not happen in 2018, but happened in 2012. But there was no reason why it shouldn't have happened in 2018 too. And what if this had happened in the same year as Hurricane Katrina, when it destroyed New Orleans and um, there was a 
and, and a huge catastrophe there. What if in the same year Hurricane Sandy had destroyed um, New York, and then we would have had another snow catastrophe as it happened one year later in 2019 in December between New, New York and Chicago. How would um, a Trump administration or a George W. administration or even a Biden administration have been able to deal with this kind of catastrophe? I want to highlight um, this here because it is that is really the problem with climate change. It's not a, a big wave that is going to um, you know, swept us all away. And so it is not a, a threat to mankind. It is um, a threat to democracy. It's a threat to our um, state of law and um, our relatively stable states um, that we, um, that we, uh, that we live in and, and that we enjoy. Um, there is one other possible impact of climate change or cause of climate change that has been that has occurred in 2019 very briefly, and that is a synchronized drought um, in all the three breadbaskets of the planet. If the the jet stream actually shows a wave pattern of so-called wave number seven, meaning it has seven bellies around the globe. And when when this wave structure is synchronized or um, stabilized by the Rocky Mountains, then we would have a situation where all um, three breadbaskets in the Midwest of the United States, in Europe and in um, Russia or, and Ukraine are going to be hit simultaneously by a drought. And that could seriously impact our food supply on the planet. In summary, we have to account for weather extremes in our future. We know that it's economically best to limit global warming below two degrees. Um, that is, if you take the costs of climate mitigation, of limiting carbon dioxide to um, and going to zero, and if you weigh these with the damages that climate change is going to cost in the future, um, if you weigh these two, then the minimal costs globally are um, around two degrees of global warming. So it also makes economically sense to do to limit uh, global warming. Um, but in some way, well, I want to say that climate change is going to hit us from two sides. On the one side, we have to get to zero carbon emissions, which is the biggest structural change in the to the world economy that we have undergone so far purposefully, not being you know um, driven by innovation by new technologies, but actually by um, purposefully changing something in the world economy. And we'll have to do this while the weather extremes intensify around us, because if we don't combat climate change, um, there is no limit. We can, we have enough, found enough carbon dioxide, uh, we haven't found enough coal um, in the ground to elevate temperature by five degrees by the end of this century, by 10 degrees by the end of the next century, and by 15 degrees by the end of the following century after that. So um, the only way to stop, to, to stabilize the temperature of, of the planet is by zero carbon emissions. And um, if we don't stop it, it, it won't stop. It'll continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Leverman. Um, so we, we don't have much time, um, but just one question and one observation which are linked and, and really I think bring this together with infection and sepsis. So you might not feel able to answer scientifically, but what is the impact of climate change on the development of new infection? And that links to an observation earlier around the potential for release of historic microorganisms from per permafrost influenced by climate change. Um, I assume they're talking about extremophile bacteria and similar. Any observations I, or thoughts on those? Yeah, well, um, like a, an hour ago, I talked to the European Engineering, um, um, not Congress, but uh, an association. Um, and what I, I, whenever I talk to industry or like, I, I talk a lot to to people like you who are not from the field but have a, a very special expertise in, in in their field a very important expertise which i don't know anything about and the, that's why, why i never never say something about the respective field but what i can tell you is the following and there are two things 
that that happen under climate change and under global warming, and that is a shift in certain quantities. That is the shift of the of the climate zones, and these are generally or, or the sea level rise or things like this. So slow moving, large scale things. Permafrost thawing is one of these, and on top of that, there is a like a a, a firework fireworks that is um that is weather extremes and that is rapid small scale change that only are localized but come from every, any direction and are not predictable so these are the two things that happen and in general this is shaking this the systems that we live in and uh, and that's probably the 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 best information that i can give you is that um, the permafrost thawing is one possible you know um source of 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 new um, of of, of uh, um, biological um, problems that that we we might be facing, but there can, there could be a number of others. I cannot I, I cannot you know grasp these fully, but the problem is the change, and uh, and I think we 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 don't have something, um, um, we don't have a like a, an an overall adaptation strategy. Uh, every every different discipline has to work on this separately. Thank you so much for that um, erudite but quite frightening response. And, and I think we, we bring this together and our president of Texas pointed this out quite rightly that, you know, we, we need to think about climate change and its impact on emerging infections and sepsis. Uh, drought and malnutrition, which might arise related to increased sectors, together with mass migration and, and war. And I do note in the chat that we've got colleagues joining us from Sudan and a warm welcome to them. And these are all going to impact on the existential threat to mankind that sepsis and AMR pose. So thank you so much, um, Professor Leverman. So we need to move on. But just before we do, um, uh, session two is going to start on time. So that will start at uh, 15.30 Central European time, which is in six minutes. You will need to uh, leave this session um, and go to that session if you want to join session two. We're going to continue with this session for another 20 minutes. We've got about 2,000 people with us right now from across many, many countries from all corners of the globe, which, which is absolutely wonderful. So we'll move on. Um, we're going to hear now about the potential of G7 and G20 partners to fight global threats. And we're going to hear from Alan Donnelly, who's convened the G20 Health and Development Partnership, which is a partnership aiming to make sure that G20 countries coordinate their health innovation strategy, particularly with respect to communicable, communicable and non-communicable communicable diseases. So, Alan, thank you very much for joining us. No, it's great to be with you today and with Conrad and congratulations to the colleagues from the Sepsis Alliance for organizing the Congress. Um, I think that this is very, very timely um, because uh, in, uh, in a, a few days time, there will be the G7 heads of government meeting in Japan. Uh, then in September, there'll be the um, heads of government meeting for the G20. And of course, we then move into the UN General Assembly in September, where we'll be looking at universal health coverage. And then next year at the UN General Assembly, there'll be a special session on antimicrobial resistance. And the one thing that's very clear in terms of the work that I do as an advisor to the Japanese uh, G7 Global Task Force and in chairing the G20 Health and Development Partnership is that we we always fall into the trap of, of having silos when it comes to uh, disease. And I'm not a clinician, I'm a, a former politician. I was a, a leading member of the European Parliament. And what we've tried to do uh, in the course of the last um, five years, five or six years, uh, since Germany first placed health on the G20 agenda under Angela Merkel's um, leadership, is to break down the silos between uh, some of the disease sets and to try and get some um, common advocacy on why we need to address uh, some challenges collectively. And of course, having just come through uh, the COVID crisis, what we recognised there was the complete inadequacy 
of pandemic preparedness and response. And frankly, I'm still not sure that uh, countries are responding properly in strengthening their health systems for the next challenge. But we are now faced with uh, this other dual pandemic, which is antimicrobial resistance and also uh, sepsis. And what I want to say at the very beginning here is that the work that we do in the G20, G7 Health and Development Partnership is very practical. We want to try and influence the way in which health ministers, finance ministers and heads of government respond to these global challenges. We know, for example, that the, the cost um, of COVID-19, depending on whose statistics you look at, is somewhere between 15 and 20 trillion dollars, um, let alone the human cost, of course. And then we look at the number of lives that are lost uh, from people who are not diagnosed in time with sepsis and also the, the lives that are lost um, because of drug resistance uh, in, the, in the population. And so what we are going to try and do uh, within the G20, G7 Health and Development Partnership at our own summit meeting on the 20, 21st and 22nd of June, and in our subsequent work, is to, is to really target um, antimicrobial re resistance. And I'm conscious about the fact that sepsis in terms of COVID, you know, it's very clear that there was a very high incidence of viral sepsis. So what we want to do is focus in <clears throat> in this area and look at what the practical solutions could be. And it was very interesting looking at uh, Conrad's slide. And we've done some of our own research on this, talking to health ministers in particular. <clears throat> and it's quite disturbing how um, little sepsis plays in the uh, in the national uh, health strategies of countries around the world. Um, it's very disturbing that in terms of the training of health professionals, and I'm not only talking about uh, doctors here, I'm talking about clinicians throughout the health system, uh, how little training there is to identify sepsis. And as you will know as clinicians, uh, if someone uh, goes undiagnosed, then death can happen uh, very rapidly. And so one of the things that we really want to focus in on uh, in the coming months is to get governments to address uh, the, the mechanisms that they have. For example, the laboratory capacity for diagnosis uh, of sepsis, both in ICUs, but generally in hospital wards, where there's a, there's a significant uh, lack of laboratory capacity to do this. We need to make sure that health professionals and clinicians, people in low and middle income countries who are offering nursing support in remote locations, that there is a concerted effort to make sure that uh, there is an understanding on how to diagnose uh, sepsis. And we will be pushing, um, and I know Conrad, I hope Conrad will be at the uh, G20, G7 uh, uh, annual summit at the World Health Organization in June. We will be pushing very strongly uh, to make sure that they don't, that they, the leaders don't go off and deal with AMR as another silo without recognizing that sepsis must be addressed too. And the way that we plan to do this is uh, we've already started the dialogue with the leaders group on AMR. And one of the rapporteurs on this is uh, Dame Sally Davis who's the former chief medical officer for uh, England. And I was with her last weekend uh, where we were talking about this issue. And so what, we've, what we need to do is have a very active campaign. And I would urge the Sepsis Alliance uh, to really target and to, to uh, work with us on, a, on a, a very, very active strategy because we, we have got to make sure that the leaders group that was set up to deal with antimicrobial resistance also addresses in its work uh, the question of, of sepsis and the question of uh, viral sepsis. And we've got to have very clear recommendations of what we're asking for uh, if we're going to talk to 
this leaders group. And over the course of the next two or three weeks, we will have a, uh, a session through the G20, G7 Health and Development Partnership with Sally Davis. And I hope that Conrad and colleagues from the Sepsis Alliance will join us. And we need to have a narrative. We need to have a mantra uh, on sepsis so that in the, the work that will be done in the coming months, both in the context of the G20 and the G7, but also in the context of the UN's General Assembly session on universal health coverage and then next year's session on AMR, that we, we have a common narrative uh, on this issue and we're very clear in a limited number of recommendations that we need to put forward. And what we will do, and I give you this commitment, at the end of our uh, summit meeting um, in June at World Health Organization's headquarters, we will include concrete recommendations and we will then pursue them aggressively with, uh, with um, heads of government, uh, with, fine, with health ministers, but significantly Importantly, we need to talk also to finance ministers. The reason why we got action on funding uh, the vaccine um, for COVID-19 and its eventual rollout, although it was pretty, it wasn't equitable, was because we engaged finance ministers in this discussion. And so we need to talk in a language that they uh, understand. Um, in relation to uh, the, 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 this, uh, these recommendations we put forward. What we're finding now in so many areas of health system strengthening, um, you know, we're finding a lack of um, health, health professionals in many communities, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries. And we're finding um, a lack of tools. So for example, tools to diag rapidly diagnose and accurately uh, diagnose certain communicable diseases and at the moment we're working with some groups uh, in different countries around the world uh, looking at the use of artificial intelligence to rapidly diagnose sepsis and uh, later today after this conference actually I'm in, I'm in Berlin at the moment and I'll be meeting one of the groups uh, that will be do that will be that that is working in this very field so we need good diagnosis we need, uh, we need good data. One of the things that moves the, the dial with senior politicians is to be able to present them with accurate data. But again, we're finding that in some hospitals, frankly, they don't really want to report on the incidence of AMR uh, or sepsis. And as I said earlier, in the case of a lack of training, uh, the, the diagnosis, in fact, on sepsis is not... Uh, is not taking place. And the, the, the lack of um, training in this area, uh, you know, I assumed it was in, in you know, some of the, the lowest income countries in the world. It's not true. It's true also across the European Union, where there, there is simply a lack of training in being able to identify this. So I'd, I'd also like the, the Sepsis um, uh, Alliance to look at the deployment of artificial intelligence <clears throat> in diagnosis and uh, to see how we can try and introduce this as part of our, uh, our approach to the World Health Organization. Now, given that we're going to be in the World Health Organization's headquarters for our event, and given what Conrad has said about the fact that there, there hasn't been the same recognition for sepsis as there has been for uh, other uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. This will be an opportunity for us to have the discussion with directors from the WHO um, and there will be leading politicians uh, who will be present where we can, we can discuss with them on how we take this forward. The other thing I wanted to say to you is that we, um, next year we have, Brazil has the G20 presidency and Italy has the presidency of the G7. Now, we are already having discussions with um, Brazil, and that took place last week in, <coughs> excuse me, in Goa at the G20 Health Working Group. And we will soon be talking to the Italians about their G7 presidency. What we would like is for a joint initiative 
by uh, Italy and by Brazil next year in the run-up to the AMR uh, high-level meeting, which will take place in New York at the UN General Assembly, uh, for, for sepsis to be incorporated <coughs> Excuse me, in that discussion. Finally, the um, Saudi Arabia, <coughs> excuse me, Saudi Arabia has the presidency of the ministerial meeting in November next year on antimicrobial resistance. We are already talking to the Saudis to make sure that part of that ministerial meeting is dedicated to the issue of sepsis too. And we need to make sure that the Sepsis Alliance writes to the Saudis and asks for this to be included in the agenda. So before my voice gives up, what I really think we need to do is we need a clear set, a limited set of recommendations. We all need to be saying the same thing. We need to be saying those <coughs> following on from the German G7 uh, presidency in 2022. We need to be saying those at all of the international fora that will be taking place. And certainly the Alliance will have our support within the partnership. And then what we need to make sure is that when these uh, meetings, these important meetings next year are taking place on AMR, that it is an AMR stroke sepsis discussion and that the conclusions address the spectrum that uh, AMR and sepsis present uh, to the world. If we don't do that, we will not address universal health coverage. And we are just going to see both the human cost and the financial cost of, of sepsis continue to increase. And it will be debilitating whether you're in a low or middle income country or whether you're in a high income country. And it can be fixed, I think, as Conrad said in his introduction. This can be fixed, but we need the cooperation of politicians. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, I, I'm not seeing direct questions to you in the chat. <coughs> A lot of agreement around uh, diagnostics. And I would add my own prejudice. This is around proper systems integration of point of care diagnosis and uh, diagnostics and rapid access by clinicians as, as well as data. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just ask one question because none, none are coming in through the chat. You talked very eloquently about, about the silos that exist and the risk of the AMR silo kind of subsuming the sepsis agenda, where, whereas, you know, really, as we all know, AMR doesn't really kill human beings, untreatable infection does as a consequence of AMR and the mode of death is sepsis. How critical is it that we try to unpick these silos and reframe the politicians understanding of this such that sepsis, AMR and infection prevention are considered under the same umbrella, umbrella as the pillars of infectious disease management? Well, I mean, it's a really interesting point. I. I... I was talking um, last week to um, a number of the organizations that are campaigning uh, on issues related to cancer. And some of the leading clinicians I talked to said, um, you know, you can't take cancer as a silo because if someone has their uh, immunity impacted by chemotherapy or by, by other treatments, then the likelihood of them uh, suffering, a, a, you know, a drug resistant uh, or being infected by a drug resistant pathogen, which then leads to um, death from from sepsis, is very very significant. And so, one of the things I think uh, we're going to try and do in June of this year is actually to invite um, leading representatives from the the oncology community to come and talk about the links between these things. But I can tell you at the moment, uh, they, and this will probably happen at the World Health Assembly next month, these things are siloed. And we have got to break this down because, uh, you know, pe people who had, uh, you know, if sufferers from HIV, AIDS, people with tuberculosis, were far more likely to die from COVID-19. I mean, the you know, the, the, the issue of multi-infection is a serious issue. And uh, for people like me, you know, I'm, I'm in a, uh, from an economic background, but I've learned a lot in the last six years, 
uh, we have to understand the way in which these diseases impact one another and how it impacts uh, humanity, human health, and how it impacts the, the, the bottom line when it comes to investing in our health systems. Thank you so much, Alan. And, you know, huge food for thought there, but uh, we really must move on. So our final speaker in this session and uh, apologies from the team that we have run over slightly and apologies from me as moderator. The final speaker is Professor Beata Kampmann. Um, she's an infectious disease, a pediatric infectious diseases clinician by background. She's worked extensively in many countries around the world and particularly in the Gambia. And she is currently Professor of Global Health and Scientific Director of the newly established Charité Centre for Global Health. And she's going to talk to us about the role of public health to fight global health threats. Beate, thank you. Thank you for this kind introduction and uh, also for the invitation to this incredibly important uh, global context and uh, subject. And Ron, um, it's great to know that uh, Alan is also in Berlin, so maybe we can <laughs> liaise. So, um, right, so this is um, the topic that I was given by the organizers, and uh, it's a really quite a tricky topic. I decided to present you my view and my experience in research. I'm a clinician scientist in pediatric infectious diseases, and I've spent uh, probably the early phases of my training resuscitating uh, children with meningococcal septicemia on UK intensive care units. But also I've worked for uh, over 15 years in resource poor settings, and I want to bring a little bit of the flavor of the, the understanding and the uh, challenges also that we have when we are trying to translate public health to global health threats. So um, the first thing to say is we usually start off with personal health because we are physicians. However, what we are doing uh, for personal health also has an impact on public health because from the person it goes to the community and from the community, it's just a question of definition, whether we put the community into the global uh, spectrum or perspective, and that ultimately also relates to planetary health, as our colleague um, has just uh, very eloquently also demonstrated. However, it's a hugely difficult subject to grasp. And for me, things work when I put them into the context of a particular case study. So the case study that uh, I have uh, chosen here is one of neonatal sepsis and AMR, and uh, I hope this will resonate with the audience. Um, as you know, the global neonatal deaths uh, are still considerable with 2.4 million, and one of the main causes of neonatal deaths is in fact neonatal infections. And uh, my group has uh, spent some time in thinking around etiology uh, on the global space is also transmission pathways. And I just want to present you a few snapshots how we've tried to come from the individual patient to the global context in this space. So sources of infections amongst newborns are several. They could be the mother, the hospital, or the environment. And uh, when we're thinking about vulnerable neonates in uh, intensive care units or high dependency units in many countries, they can have many, many different flavors. And the hands of carers and healthcare workers are unfortunately a huge source of contamination as can be intravenous medications. Uh, and with a focus on the overcrowded neonatal units that we find in particularly resource poor settings, we have conducted some research on uh, trying to understand what is causing the neonatal admissions, how quality of care impacts and what the outcome could be. And these are just some already published data for a while uh, from the Gambia, where we sh uh, saw this possibly severe bacterial infections accounted for 44% of all admissions to the neonatal unit, uh, where we're talking about here in the Gambia, with an incredibly high mortality rate, which is incredibly um, uh, disheartening for everybody who's looking after these little babies, never mind their families. We saw very high use of antibiotics and very few investigations, and this resonates with um, words that Alan has already mentioned, such as uh, lack of access to diagnostics. There's hardly any blood culture bottles in a lot of the countries where we work. So one of my wonderful PhD students, uh, Dr. Udwako Kumo, conducted a, a systematic review and meta-analysis to look at uh, what is actually the etiology of neonatal infections in sub-Saharan Africa. And what we basically saw is of no surprise because 
the individual pathogens we find in the high income settings are also really present in West, Central, Eastern and Southern Africa with maybe a little bit of variability between meningitis and neonatal bacteremia or sepsis, although sometimes in the neonate, this is even very difficult to distinguish because the blood brain barrier is so um, uh, leaky. So Klebsiella, Staph Cox, Staph aureus, and E. coli are the leading causes. And uh, we looked at um, how these bacteria could also be found in our settings. And uh, we stumbled across a large outbreak of hospital acquired neonatal infections, which we analyzed systematically, also including academic tools such as um, next generation genomic sequencing. And this is where the academic input into the whole field of how we might be dealing with sepsis and how we might be translating discoveries into policy and practice might play a role. So a few years ago, um, we realized there was an outbreak of Bocalderia capacia in 49 sepsis cases in the neonatal unit. We then did uh, some infection control mechanisms and uh, that all went away. And then that was uh, swiftly followed by an outbreak of Klebsiella. We discovered that, um, first of all, to say that the case fatality rate was horrendous, uh, but essentially it was due to extrinsic contamination of IV fluids and antibiotics. And this was all primarily down to lack of facilities, lack of training, lack of hand hygiene, lack of basic infection control practice, which is not a very sexy topic, is incredibly difficult to get funding for, but is probably the root cause for many of the hospital-acquired infections that we're seeing. So we applied um, whole genome sequencing to, trans to define the transmission pathways and characterize two distinct outbreaks. And this was uh, published um, a couple of years back. Um, to give you some details uh, on the outbreak investigation, without going to through much detail, uh, it was very systematically um, worked up and it was found that the source was actually intravenous antibiotics and fluids where on the trolley of um, antibiotics that had to be given to patients, they were all drawn up from the same bottle of uh, uh, diluting fluid with sodium chloride or, or uh, water for injections that had been parading around on that trolley in the neonatal unit for the majority of the day, and I think primarily with the same needle in that prong. So there were clearly lapses in nursing procedures and suboptimal hand hygiene, uh, but it's a far cry from the individually packed uh, normal saline or um, water for injection uh, ampules that we find in our ne neonatal units or in hospitals in general. So when we started to um, sequence these organisms, we also saw uh, if you look at this diagram, which shows uh, the sex, the age, and the time of acquisition of the particularly um, particular strains of Bocalderia here, um, we already had a, a problem in 2015, but it was much amplified uh, with sort of phylogenetic trees here showing four different clades of Bocalderia uh, with isolates collected from early and uh, later neonatal uh, stays on the neonatal unit. When we um, then got to grips with this infection uh, outbreak by infection control, we a few months later found isolates from 39 patients and one environmental sample uh, identifying two subspecies of Klebsiella, which you can see here, there uh, is a Klebsiella quasi pneumoniae subspecies and a Klebsiella pneumoniae. And what was quite uh, shocking is the level of resistance to antibiotics, um, which, as you can see here in the boxes that I framed, uh, comprised just about everything apart from sulfonamides. And when we put this to also the um, phenotypical testing, we found excellent concordance between the genomics and the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the subsequent phenotypical testing. And that basically left us with chloramphenicol in some of these neonates. But the mortality rate was so high that most of these babies were lost before any treatment uh, could actually be instigated that might have saved them. So going back to the personal health, the question then is, where do these bacteria come from? And what is the role of maternal transmission? And in order to investigate this particular angle, we undertook a paired study of mother newborn pairs 
and investigated microbiologically by uh, taking cultures from babies who were admitted to the neonatal unit and uh, their mothers um, through rectal vaginal swaps. And we matched up pairs um, uh, of isolates that uh, were again whole genome sequenced because it's very easy to say the transmission occurs from the mother when actually a lot of the transmission occurs in the nosocomial setting and our infection control uh, interventions would have to be completely differently um, oriented. So this was also uh, published last year and here's a snapshot of how this all happened. Um, we had uh, newborn blood cultures from 202 infants and maternal genital cultures from their mothers. Uh, 91 of the blood cultures were positive, lots of them obviously with clinically non-significant isolates, as we also all know, a lot of um, staph epi, um, but also phenotypically matched paired maternal newborn isolates. Uh, phenotypically matched, so just grown on culture. But when we went on to sequence these, we saw actually that genetically related, we only stumbled across four out of 11 of these isolates. So in um, conclusion, we had to say that there was actually in our setting a lack of strong evidence to support vertical transmission of pathogenic bacteria from mother to neonate. Of course, these are small samples, but they illustrate that the um, granularity with which we can understand transmission and um, evolution of antimicrobial resistance in settings can be hugely improved by um, uh, novel genomic tools. What is incredibly obvious from the work that I've just presented that in going from the local to public to global health, there are implications for policy and practice that relate to prevention, care, detection, response and systems. And in particular, in uh, low and middle income countries, the detection mechanisms are fairly rudimentary and we have very little access to blood cultures and uh, you know, modern biomarkers that might also support uh, an infection, which is where the idea of AI is quite interesting, although uh, lots of these um, algorithms would have to be validated in, in a number of settings. So the sequencing of um, strains that are collected on a sort of genome-based surveillance studies, as we, for example, had with COVID, to improve identification of circulating pathogens, strains, and characterize the antimicrobial resistance, is routine in some of our hospitals, um, but certainly not routine in public health, and a far cry away from routine in the global setting. And there's a lot of translational gap to be closed and a lot of issues of equity um, and how we can really address these complex interactions in the uh, individual systems between public and global health where we find ourselves. So um, to say again, the identification of organisms and the AMR profile obviously allows us personalized antibiotic therapy in our setting, provided there is a range of antibiotics around that we can even choose from. Hospital infection control, of course, for the public health sector. And in the global health spectrum, there is an enormous benefit of the contribution to global databases regarding circulating resistance genes. And a lot of effort has gone into, for example, the global Klebsiella uh, antimicrobial resistance mapping. Group B strep uh, is another one where there's big um, efforts internationally to understand strains that are of relevance for prevention through group B strep vaccines, for example. And the impact on antibiotic use in global communities cannot be underestimated. And again, we need to have much better One Health knowledge because, as we all know, a lot of AMR is driven um, by antibiotics used in the animal uh, uh, context. So in conclusion, I think national public health policies and practices can certainly inform global stakeholders in order to bridge the gaps in knowledge. And this needs to go from local to regional to international. And that also um, implies that we have to share data. I really strongly believe that research and academic institutions have an important role to play. And uh, Conrad alluded to this as well. And the novel technologies can enhance our efforts, but there remains an incredible translational gap. And the domestic public health requires strong communication and trust between different agencies and organizations. And from, if I understand Alan uh, correctly, from his insights, that's even in our European context, and even perhaps here in Berlin, not always a given scenario. 
Effective global health initiatives require political and cultural diplomacy because there is an easy, you know, an easy stigmatization of um, bad practice, an easy feel of guilt in settings where infection control might not have been optimal. And we really need to work towards the so famously called no blame culture to work together to find mechanisms to combat this. So I think in a globalized world, public health is always also global. And as not only healthcare professionals, but also global citizens and also as politicians, and this is where it goes to the um, discussions that will have to be had at the World Health Assembly, we are all asked to improve the prevention and management of health threats, be they personal, local, global, or planetary. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kampman. Um, uh, the, uh, once again, there are there are a few questions uh, or no questions coming in, um, uh, and I really would encourage participants for future sessions to to interact and, and ask questions of our speakers. So, I suppose ju just one from me in the interest of time, because we are quite over time, um, because it's been such a fantastic and diverse range of presentations. Um, you talked about inequity and you talked about the challenges that low and low to middle income countries face. Have you have you seen any examples of excellent and innovative practice in those countries? And I suppose if not, are there, are there any quick wins that you could identify that would be pertinent in those countries? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a big interest in um, this might not be what you expect, but in uh, kangaroo mother care, <laughs> because uh, there is, uh, you know, there's evidence that if the infant is um, used to the maternal flora in a very comprehensive way, that this might, in a sense, uh, protect against some infections that might uh, cruise around in hospitals. And, and so kangaroo mother care is an intervention that is low key, low cost and introduced in many countries. I think we're we're kind of in the process of identifying um, host biomarkers for prediction of sepsis, and uh, not that these are properly validated, but this is a really rich area of research at the moment, because if we could particularly, not only to distinguish bacterial from viral infections, but if we could also predict infants at particular risk, that would make uh, an enormous impact because that would avoid the unnecessary use of antibiotics, which is very common in neonatal units, just uh, because we we are not sure what's going on. I think um, AI uh, algorithms, etc. I haven't yet seen the light of, but happy to explore. Of course, thank you. So one question has come in, and it, it's well, there's two now. Firstly, is screening of staff useful? I'm not sure whether that is specific to a particular pathogen or a general question. And secondly, how does public health address inequity in healthcare in the developing world under current international circumstances? Well, uh, the second one is really tricky. So the first yeah. one is a tricky one. And we face this, for example, if we've got MRSA outbreaks in, in uh, intensive care units, neonat uh, neonatal units, etc., and it's not generally a recommended policy because it leads to staff feeling guilty. Let's just say it's an MRSA, MRSA staff being fined up their noses or, um, you know, I don't think this is the way we've gone in the UK. It's certainly not the way we're going in, um, in the low income settings. And it is more a question of really insisting on very good infection control throughout the entire uh, unit and and that's one way of preventing and also making materials available if you don't have uh, gloves that you can change on a between patients uh, bed basis or if you had to have to put two or three neonates into the same cot and you have to ask various relatives to participate in their care this becomes a lot more complex so i think the infection control measurements uh, or measures are, are really the key now the second one um how we relate uh, <laughs> i mean you know this is such a big topic and this is not just an amr topic or a sepsis topic I think the, the commitment of organizations to improve their public health, um, first of all, data sharing, really important in that context, the commitment of the global community to work together uh, on sepsis definitions, on making algorithms and uh, you know, resources available, 
uh, it's almost a philosophical or if you want a, a humanitarian question and I don't think I you know we could meet over a glass of wine to discuss this but I think that will spring spring uh, it's certainly not going to happen at four o'clock with already being about half an hour late so um, thanks for that question I think it's very important to also bring in the politicians and the health economists on on this subject because a lot of money can be saved by having proper infection control. Perfect. That, thank you. That really is all time we have, uh, all, all we have time for. There is a new, another question just arisen, but I, I think we need to close this session with great respect to everyone. I would like to thank all of our wonderful speakers. I think it's been a fantastic and thought provoking opening panel and, and you know, really to summarize the intrinsic interrelationship between infection prevention and control, antimicrobial resistance, sepsis, pandemic preparedness, outbreak surveillance, and of course, climate change. And I think this really sets the agenda for a wonderful, fantastically interesting, and hopefully influential two days of sessions. So thank you to all of our participants. Thank you for your questions, which are now coming in. Unfortunately, we're out of time. And I am pleased to bring to a close the opening session of the fourth World Sepsis Congress. Thank you.